The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecki is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Gwilda Wiecki's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Science of Magic or endorsed in any manner by Gwilda Wiecki, Relmar McConnell Media Company, its affiliated networks, stations, or employees. Welcome to the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, a program dedicated to uncovering the unified nature of reality and humanity's ever-evolving place as truly galactic beings. For more information on the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome to the Science of Magic, a place where science and magic come together to transform fact into evolving truth. We're proudly coming to you through the ever-expanding X-Zone Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, and can also be found on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Golda Wiecka. This hour, we'll be exploring Let's Dance. From walking meditation to frenzied dancing, all shamanic traditions use some form of rhythm and or movement to enter an altered state known as a shamanic trance. The Hopi Kachinas dance to embody star beings. Many tribes dance to embrace the warrior spirit or bring down the rain. Some Middle Eastern dances activate and direct the kundalini. Sufi whirling is a dance meditation for many wishes and an endeavor to source all action. This is accomplished with some music and spring repairs. A symbolic imitation of plants were being served. Our dancing form practiced by numerous traditions were by John Body and his ceremony dance. We started shifting during these situations. Why do we see cross cultural use of dance throughout these? Physical movement free restrictions, pure body grounds, and activates the shock system and channel spirit into the physical world. Dance is not the only movement performing movement. When you're working in induce a trance stage, making some information accessible, but dance. Dance engages the passion through movement, rhythm, and music. Different music and rhythms inspire varying aesthetic experiences. Every tradition has songs, rhythms, and dances that have been handed down for generations to be used for particular purposes. Many practices designed to heighten spiritual power and awareness combine movement with diet. From yoga to tai chi, these practices reflect the importance of a lifestyle promoting movement and healthy food to support enlightenment. Interesting that we become such a sedentary, junk food gobbling society. Some modern day religions actually consider dancing and music to be a sin. God forbid a person find joy in movement or physical expression. When a body doesn't move, it becomes a storage place for unprocessed emotion, memories, and environmental toxins. Eventually, this blockage results in ill health. Toxicity compromises our frequency. When our frequency is low, there's a greater resistance, limiting our ability to access high-frequency spiritual information. At lower frequencies, our brains become sluggish. There's a frequency below which we can no longer maintain physical health and the weak link in the genetic predisposition chain breaks down. The body has four major organs responsible for moving, removing toxic load, the liver, kidneys, skin, and the lungs. The toxins are carried from the body by the blood to one of these locations for processing and removal. The heart is responsible for pumping the blood, yet the heart can only pump the blood out to the body the contraction and expansion of the muscles are what returns the blood to the heart, and this requires physical movement. Physical activity increases heart rate, moving the blood more rapidly through the body. Exercise also stimulates respiration, and with it, the efficiency of detoxing through the lungs. Movement encourages perspiration and flushing of toxins through the skin. In the absence of movement, the toxic load is left to the kidneys and liver. The kidneys rely on copious amounts of pure water to function. Instead, we tend to consume coffee, pop, and energy drinks, which add to the toxic load. At this point, everything is left up to the poor liver. 
When the liver can't keep up with removing the toxins, they must be stored. And where do we store them? In the tissues and fat, of course. And there you have it, the modern-day human condition, fat, sick, and spiritually disconnected. Considering the alternatives, let's dance. Our guest this hour, Yasmin Henkish, author of Trance Dancing with the Gin, is a dedicated performer, teacher, trainer, and workshop instructor with over 40 years of Middle Eastern dance experience. She researched Egyptian trance dancing while studying at the American University of Cairo. Yasmin taught Egyptian-style Middle Eastern dance at the Joy of Motion Premier Dance School until she opened her own studio, Serpentine Dance, in Maryland. After this commercial message, we'll introduce Yasmin, and together we will do the trance dance. You're listening to The Science of Magic. Prior innovative episodes can always be found on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. Though the world seems in turmoil around us, let's not lose our way. The stars still shine down, blessing us with their light. The sun rises every morning, chasing away the cold and darkness. There are good people of service in this world. We have much to be grateful for as we're wrapped in the arms of all of God's creation. This is Gwilda Wiecka, host of the Science of Magic Radio, wishing you and yours a very Merry Christmas. I hope your holiday is filled with comfort and joy as you're surrounded by those you love. I'd like to thank all of you for being our loyal listeners on the Exxon Broadcast Network and for joining us on this grand adventure called life. As the New Year's dawns, let us all stand in truth as we embrace peace. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour, Yasmin Henkish, author of Trance Dancing with the Jinn. Her website is serpentine.org. Yasmin, thank you for joining us on the Science of Magic. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> what exactly is trance dancing? Trance dancing is spontaneous movement to music. How about that? Um, that kind of works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you might call it kinetic meditation. Uh, it's uh, movement under music, but long enough to uh, alter your state of consciousness. So dancing for three minutes might not do it. Dancing for half an hour will definitely do it. <laughs> Could you speak a little louder for us? Don't want to miss a word oh. you're saying. Sorry, yes, That's okay. absolutely. <laughs> so where all is trance dancing practiced? Oh, it's practiced around the world. My specialty uh, is the Middle East, but actually it's done in, uh, in most uh, places around the world, from Africa, of course, but uh, uh, North and South America to Asia, uh, Siberia, um, almost everywhere. Uh, what What's the major purpose of trance dancing? Oh, well, um, why do we meditate? I think it's to get in contact with our subconscious. Uh, I believe that it, it helps um, to, to free a lot of things that we don't want to think about, and so we push into our subconscious and say, I'll deal with that later. And this is a way of helping to bring it up and dealing with it now. Okay, so uh, bringing up, like, does the movement break loose those things that we're trying to deny? Is that what you're saying? 
Yes. Well, uh, the process of going into trance uh, allows the subconscious memories and things that we've stored there to surface into the consciousness because we are, in fact, um, going into our subconscious while lucid. Uh, the process is, is uh, lowering our brain waves from beta to alpha to theta. And many memories, uh, particularly traumatic ones, are stored in these slower wavelengths. And the process of going there while we are still awake helps us to remember things uh, that we might not otherwise remember. So you're saying it's stored in your, your subconscious in the, in, the, in the lower states of your brain waves. Is it also mm-hmm. stored in your body? And does the actual movement start to free those things up as well? Well, uh, of course, memories are stored in the brain, yes, uh, in the cerebellum, in the cortex. Uh, there are also emotional traumatic memories, which are stored in a, a different place because those memories are, are tagged with fear or anger uh, by the amygdala. So they are stored in a different place. But yes, these things are actually stored in the brain, and uh, we remember them. So when we go into dance and we're using rhythm and movement, how important is the kind of rhythm and how important is the kind of music to what's actually going to be achieved? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, Most, and I say most, not all, but most uh, traditions use drumming, rhythmic pulsing, in order to entrain the brain to an external source, if you will. Um, Although the Sufi whirling dervishes do not use, they have drumming, but it's not the most uh, important part of what they do. But because they're whirling, which uh, truly excites the uh, balance portion of the brain, they don't need to stimulate the hearing portion as much. But yes, drumming is what is usually used the most, from shamanic traditions to Middle Eastern traditions to African traditions. Uh, Yeah. So um, I guess uh, MIT researchers have shown for the first time ever (laughs) that memories are stored in specific brain cells. By triggering a small cluster of neurons, the researchers were able to force the subject to recall a specific memory. But by removing these neurons, and how they did that, I don't know, (laughs) the subject would lose that memory. How does this line up with it also being in the body? Well, if the body isn't taking in the right nutrients and flushing out uh, the toxins, as you mentioned in the beginning of your uh, of the broadcast, um, all of those cells uh, aren't healthy, and so they can't remember or they can't function properly, if you will. It, uh, memory uh, recall is uh, firing those neurons in order for them to give off the information that they hold. So if we're lacking, um, say, for instance, some of the, the uh, minerals that we need for neurons to fire, we've got a problem going there. Absolutely. Yes, of course. And memory is not stored in just one neuron. Uh, memory and thoughts are um, spread out over a neural net. For example, if you have a memory of something you heard, you have the neurons that are associated with the auditory cortex. And if then you have an emotion associated with that, your emotional limbic system is going to come into play as well. So you, you have many different neurons all firing together, uh, combining and synchronizing their electric signals in order for you to recall that memory. Why do you think some religions judge against dancing? Um, probably because dancing releases, um, no, let me put it differently. Um, dancing blocks when you're improvising, the prefrontal cortex, 
associated with learned behavior, proper behavior, is uh, shut down to a certain extent. So in order to improvise, you stop being inhibited. And when people lose their inhibitions, they may do crazy things to outsiders, and uh, the norms of social behavior are, are upset. And particularly for cultures that hold a high uh, standard of uh, social behavior, letting go of that could be dangerous. <laughs> so what, what can you tell us, and this is a different subject, but what can you tell us about shape-shifting in trance dancing? Uh, shape shifting and trans dancing, absolutely nothing. That I don't know anything about it, so I don't want to say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so as I mentioned, the Kachinas use dance to intentionally make themselves available to spirits or star beings. And what can you tell us about trans dancing and possession? That I can definitely tell you about. <laughs> um, there are a number of stages of depth of trance. Uh, you go from lucid trance into the more profound states of which possession is one. Uh, in order to become possessed, you truly have to lose your self, uh, sense of self. Uh, you go from being dizzy to a state of flow where it's uh, automatic improvisation then you go a little deeper where you have uh, an objective observer state. Beyond that, you have uh, a, a state of dissociation, if you will, where the your soul, your entity, your personality or whatever separates from the body, if you will, and you look like you are totally observing yourself, but not in yourself. Possession comes after that. Possession comes when you have a sense of um, someone Im imposing their own um, uh, neural, uh, neural imprint overlay is what it's called, where a different personality and its different um, uh, electrical signals, if you will, takes over your personality and you are just put in the back seat and observing. So, so here we have two things going on. So we have uh, people going into trance dancing intentionally, making themselves available to channel a spirit, hopefully a helpful, helpful spirit, um, uh, who has, is benevolent. Uh, what about malevolent spirits? Can unwholesome spirits be encountered through undisciplined trance dancing? And how does one avoid that? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, yes, always you want to uh, go into anything uh, involved with spirit with a sense of um, uh, caution, certainly. If something doesn't feel right, don't let it continue. You uh, always want to uh, set up some kind of barrier uh, before you start. Uh, I, I explain more about it in, in the book. Um, but you do want to have protective objects around you that... All you have to do is look at that object and it will remind you of a happy place or a soothing feeling. Um, if something doesn't feel right, back off. Yes. Okay. So um, where, you seem to know a lot about the brain. Where, where did you get your education on neurology? Well, I, I did a great deal of research. Uh, when I was going to college, I wanted to be pre-med, but then I um, realized that I had to uh, be in the lab and kill animals, and that was just not for me. But I truly enjoyed learning about the brain, and in order to do a, a, a proper job for the book, I immersed myself in it. Wow, what kind of research did you do? 
It took a long time. Um, I had to do psychology research and uh, um, obviously the brain and uh, current uh, anthropology of uh, mainly uh, African traditions and Middle Eastern traditions, but also I because of how the the religious belief systems traveled in the slave galleys to North and South America. I also did a great deal of study of history. We're we're Uh, going to have to pick up with this on the other side of a break. I'm sorry. Jasmine and I will return to our discussion on the flip side. We're coming to you through the X-Zone Broadcast Network. Don't miss the other fine shows and hosts on xzbn.net. You're listening to The Science of Magic, thescienceofmagic.net. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. There's more fun to come, so don't you dare go away. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Did you know that shamanism has been around for 50,000 years and practiced by all indigenous cultures? These ancients understood there's more to healing and health than just the physical. All four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, must be addressed in order for us to enjoy healthy, abundant lives. To find quality shamanic healing you can trust, you need look no further than Path Home Long Distance Shamanic Healing Program. All Path Home practitioners have been trained and certified through Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a Colorado State Occupational School and are handpicked, personally trained by me, Gwilda Wiecka, to uphold the excellence of Path Home's long-distance program. Live abundantly. Schedule a shamanic session with me or one of my quality practitioners today. Call 303-775-3431 or visit findyourpathhome.com. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, a place where magic and science come together to promote enlightenment. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour, Yasmin Henkish, author of Trance Dancing with the Jinn. Jinn. Yasmin, um, can your average person learn to trance dance? What's involved in learning? Uh, The ability to let go. Normally, Everyone can do it, although uh, there are certain contraindications uh, health-wise. Um, if you have epilepsy or lung problems or heart problems, uh, if you're not used to exercise, you should perhaps check with your doctor before you start doing half an hour to 45 minutes of strenuous activity. Um, but other than that, anybody can do it. So once you start dancing, um, I've, I've kind of experienced this myself. So you get, you start dancing. So you intentionally start to move your body, right? But then Mm -hmm. there comes a time when it's like the body's moving you. Can you tell us about that? That's a state called flow where your autonomic nervous system seems to take over and, It's like somebody who is a professional, uh, far more experienced than you are, seems to take over your body and uh, you do all kinds of wonderful things that you never knew you could do. Yes, that is the essence of trance dancing. What's the advantage of it? What what happens there? What's what's the advantage of doing it that way? Uh, Pure improvisation. By... Not focusing and thinking too hard about what you want to do, it frees your mind up. This is where that prefrontal cortex uh, starts to shut down that tells you you shouldn't be doing this or that because of your learned inhibitions. That's when it gets shut down, and all of a sudden you know that you can do anything. And it's this process of shutting down that part of the brain that allows new ideas to pop into your mind. 
things that you would normally say, oh, that couldn't be right, all of a sudden it can be right. And you you start thinking of new possible ways to do things and creative solutions to old problems. Hmm? You know, um, we, we spoke earlier about how sometimes, um, in fact, very often, trans dancing can access and activate old memories and traumas. Uh, can this be overwhelming? And what advice do you have for your students when this happens? Everything can be put on hold. What I mean by that is, if you stop dancing, the sensations will go away. Um, if memories start to surface that are perhaps uh, traumatic, uh, things that you may have um, repressed, uh, your brain, once you stop dancing and come out of this uh, trance state, you, your brain comes back up to beta from the theta uh, stage, um, your brain will process this in its own time. Uh, and if it doesn't, and if you find that you have latent uh, anxiety, well, then perhaps it's a good idea to go see a professional because you certainly don't want to have those kind of things influencing the rest of your life. Whether you have trans dance or not, those issues would still be there, but you just wouldn't be aware of them. So once they start to get triggered, um, and if there's, you know, if the person's having difficulty moving them, do you have a referral base that you send people to? No, I don't. Uh, I would say that uh, go see uh, um, uh, psychiatric help or uh, start talking to friends and neighbors or family that might have known you uh, when you were younger. Uh, the whole process of talking about something often helps to alleviate and to bring forward into clarity. Uh, it transfers, the process of talking about something transfers uh, s memories that were repressed from this emotional amygdala memory base into your historic uh, uh, narrative history uh, in the cortex. Oh, so it's like so a you're shifting. It's like a decompartmentalization and then it goes into long-term memory without the charge. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. Yes. Interesting. So what can you tell us about the kundalini in trance dancing? I, I really can't tell you anything about that. In my experience, in my research, I never came across it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, do you um, did you come across any place where dancing affects or can help clear the chakras? Certainly, anything that helps you uncover uh, repressed memories or anything that you have pushed out of your mind uh, certainly would help clean the chakras. Do you see the modern-day use of trance dancing aiding in spiritual evolution? And if so, how? Oh, I do. Uh, simply because uh, it, it allows you to talk to the spirit world. And the spirit world it has far more information that they are trying to impart to us. But they, uh, the lines of communication are very difficult. And this is one way that enables the human brain to connect with the ethereal world and in, to receive some of their knowledge. Would you mind telling us what you mean by spirit world and who do you find there? Oh, my Lord. Uh, <laughs> if you... Um, <laughs> In the Middle Eastern tradition, which is really what I'm focusing on, um, the Quran, for example, uh, states that there are four different types of uh, spirit entities. You have the souls, uh, the souls of the dead, the souls of, of humans, which are the breath of God, if you will. You have uh, 
angels, which are considered made of light. You have the jinn, which are plasma spirits. Um, and then, of course, you have uh, the devils, the shaitan, which are the souls and the jinn who have uh, chosen the dark path, if you will. Okay, so they've chosen the dark path. What's the dark path? Oh, excuse me? I said, what's the dark path? Um, the path of non-evolution. Um, I'm not wise enough to know much about the dark path because I don't travel it. Uh, I would just say you can feel it when it comes, and I have always shied away from it. Okay. Sorry. How, it's okay. How do you feel it? What's it like? Um, the minute you start feeling violent thoughts or angry thoughts or hatred thoughts or dislike of anything, uh, that's the dark side. Does the Quran teach against that? The Quran is a very complicated book. Uh, I have not studied all of it. I have studied very carefully the parts where they talk about the jinn. Um, I know that they there is much good and much light in the Quran um, when they talk about uh, repressing women, for example, that doesn't exist in the Quran. That is a modern interpretation of it. Um, I, uh, I'm not going to go there. I am That's not okay. going to say that. That's okay. I just wondered if you knew. Um, so, you studied in Cairo and dance. What kind? What particular form did you learn there? What particular? Uh, Dance forms uh, did you learn when you were studying in Cairo? Oh, Middle Eastern. That was really all that ever interested me uh, was uh, belly dancing, but also the folkloric dances and the Sufi whirling and the zikr. Uh, these are all, uh, and the czar, of course, uh, You, they are not belly dancing, and they are not even considered folkloric dances. They are religious dances, if you will. Uh, I studied all of them because I found everything, uh, all of it fascinating. So the Sufi dances, weren't they originally male dancers, but they wore skirts and that fanned out real pretty? <laughs> the Sufi costume was, in fact... Uh, the clothes that men wore in the 1200s when um, Rumi, uh, Jalal Rumi, um, I won't say invented it, but certainly uh, codified his, his form of ecstatic dance. So it's simply the clothes that they wore at the time. Got it. It's certainly beautiful to watch, isn't it? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. When did women start doing it? Um, I would say within, in Turkey, uh, within the past 10, 20 years, um, it's public display of dancing for women in the Middle East is not looked upon favorably. Um, and any public display of women, for example, women do not participate in public zikrs either. Uh, those, it's a male domain. But they do participate, but in private. Right, so they, they dance, but they dance in private or around their family, but certainly not out in public, correct? Exactly, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're very protective, I'm sure, of their women, as I recall. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't want them out there dancing in public, right? 
No, absolutely not. And certainly when you're trance dancing uh, and you go deep into trance, I mean, your eyes roll up into your head, you can foam at the mouth, you do all <laughs> kinds of crazy things, and nobody wants their wives out there uh, being looked at like that. Twitching and drooling and all that fun stuff. And, well, <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> I don't want to be out there looking like that either. <laughs> well, you know, it sounds it sounds like a very uh, personal and intimate time, so I can certainly understand. We're going to have exactly. to take another quick break. Yasmin and I will be back shortly, so don't you guys leave us now. This is the Science of Magic, the scienceofmagic.net, the place where altruistic professionals of science and the esoteric create common ground for the betterment of our world. We're brought to you daily by the leader in paranormal, spirituality, and alternative health programming, the X-Zone Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. Though the world seems in turmoil around us, let's not lose our way. The stars still shine down, blessing us with their light. The sun rises every morning, chasing away the cold and darkness. There are good people of service in this world. We have much to be grateful for as we're wrapped in the arms of all of God's creation. This is Gwilda Wiecka, host of the Science of Magic Radio, wishing you and yours a very Merry Christmas. I hope your holiday is filled with comfort and joy as you're surrounded by those you love. I'd like to thank all of you for being our loyal listeners on the Exxon Broadcast Network and for joining us on this grand adventure called life. As the New Year's dawns, let us all stand in truth as we embrace peace. Welcome back, folks. This is the Science of Magic, bringing together gifted people of service to the world. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour, Yasmin Henkish, author of Trance Dancing with the Jinn. Yasmin, which brings me to the next question, what are the jinn? Uh, the jinn are uh, known throughout the world because of their special place in the Quran. Uh, they are Middle Eastern fire spirits or plasma spirits, uh, similar to the fairy, but um, not quite. They are not quite the same. Uh, certainly Orion uh, Foxwood, who is a gifted fairy seer, has seen both of them and um, will uh, definitely state that the fairy are uh, uh, composed slightly differently than the jinn. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, there's there's the fairy folk. Of course, I'm trained in Celtic shamanism as well as working with the jinn. And um, in the Celtic tradition, there's the fairy folk. But then among the fairy folk, there are the she, and that's the kings and queens of the fairy. And if you their job is to balance nature. So if you're in balance, if you're living a life in balance, they don't mess with you. But if, if you live a life out of balance, you have much to fear from them. And I found there was a lot to be, a lot of similarities between them and the jinn. Do you, do you believe that's true? Unfortunately, I don't know much about the fairy tradition at all. So I really can't say. Um, my, I have focused so uh, keenly on the jinn uh, that I haven't really studied the other traditions. I do know that the angelic uh, beings, that there are fire, um, what do they call them? Um, uh, fire angels, seraphim, that's it, mm -hmm. uh, who sound to me very much like they include plasma in their normal 
makeup of light, if you will. Um, and they are mentioned in the Bible, uh, but I don't know about the fairy traditions at all. So what? It, uh, how do you, you're using the word plasma. What is it in the way you're using it? Plasma is the fourth state of matter. Uh, plasma is in, uh, you can find it in fire. Uh, you can find it in the filaments that are formed in order to conduct lightning out of the sky to the ground. Uh, plasma exists to protect our atmosphere in, in, uh, from the solar wind. Otherwise, we would have no oxygen. Uh, plasma exists all around us in the visible universe. Plasma represents 99% of everything that is visible. It is uh, the state of matter where the electrons are dissociated from their nuclei, from the protons and neutrons. And they tend to form uh, masses uh, of electrons and masses of protons, uh, whereas the two masses together uh, form a neutral charge. But each individually... Uh, has a very strong uh, negative or positive charge. So it's created by adding energy to gas so that some of its electrons leave its atoms. And if you have electrons leaving atoms, that's when they become polarized and create the positive or negative charge. So that being the case, does it serve as a conduit for spirit by attraction and repulsion? I am not sure how it works, whether it's a conduit, and uh, oftentimes plasma will form layers, double layers. You'll have a layer of uh, um, negative and, a, and then a layer of positive, and in between those layers you will have a place that conducts electricity. It could form skin, for all I know, when you have <laughs> layers like that. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, a lot of research needs to be done about it. Uh, but it does form tentacles, it does form uh, filaments, um, but I'm not sure. Well, it sounds, sounds, if they are indeed plasma beings, it sounds like they have a lot of hidden aspects it would be wonderful to figure out. Absolutely, yeah. yes. So, but they the are, I'm sorry, plasma oh, does conduct electricity, and it is sensitive to mag electromagnetic uh, forces. So uh, if uh, one of the things that um, uh, folklore loves to say is that the jinn are afraid of iron, which of course is a magnetic, uh, has magnetic properties. I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, you didn't. I was sitting here fascinated. <laughs> so do you think that the genie stories originated with the jinn? You know, like I dream of genie and the genie in the bottle. Oh, well, of course, genie is the uh, uh, English word for jinn. Uh, genie also comes, if you think about it, back to Latin from uh, the singular form of a uh, tutelary spirit called a genius or a genie. So it, it goes back to Latin. Gotcha. So how, how do you trance dance with the jinn? <laughs> Well, you have to have music that you love. Really, you can't be dancing without any music. You you can, but it's it's certainly no fun. Um, you want to get music that is fast, with a a, a definite uh, beat to it that you enjoy. Uh, you want to get your emotions involved because the more heightened emotions you have. Uh, the quicker you will react and your brain will lower its wavelengths and you will go into theta. Um, keep at it. Just keep dancing. Blank out. Stop thinking, oh, what move will I do next? Just let yourself go and move whatever way you want to to the music and keep at it. And all of a sudden you'll find yourself flowing with the music, one with the music, your emotions will be heightened, and then you'll start having what they call theta flares, which is 
light bulb moments where problems that you've been trying to solve forever, all of a sudden the, the answer is right before your eyes. You just know what to do. Our guest this hour is Yasmin Henkish, author of Trance Dancing with a Gin. Her website is serpentine.org. Yasmin, when you go into trance dancing, is it wise to go in with an intent or a question? Does it help focus? Oh, absolutely. Yes, it does. Um, the brain, the spirits, they love a challenge. They love something to work on. And so if you give it a, a, a goal, if you will, uh, then it makes uh, it that much more fun. So, so yes. um, do you trance dance on behalf of others at times, like going, like using it as a divinational tool? I can, um, but I find that it's better for someone to do it themselves because I often don't uh, know all of the ins and outs of a situation. Uh, I can be fairly intuitive, but um, it's better that they do it themselves. Do you think that trance dancing helps develop a person's intuition? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It opens the conduits to theta. Theta is where you, uh, theta and, of course, delta, but when you're in too much delta, you obviously go unconscious. Uh, Theta is where you receive your subconscious messages, the messages from things all around you that you don't necessarily perceive on a conscious level, but your subconscious perceives it, and it feeds it to you when when you descend into Theta. You can uh, bring it back with you to consciousness. So, yes. So are you saying that our unconscious or subconscious has a more direct connection to spirit or to all that is than our conscious does? Yes, I do. Because consciousness is in part formed by our learned behavior. And if your society tells you spirits don't exist, or this information doesn't exist, or if I can't see it, I don't believe in it, then you won't believe in it. Then you will stop your mind and you will cut off these this other form of information that's coming to you. Do you think that trance dancing can smooth the boundaries between the different levels, the different um, uh, states, whether it's beta or alpha or theta, so that we can come and go more easily? Oh, absolutely. I have found that to be true, yes. The more experience I have descending into theta, uh, the quicker I can go, the more it bleeds into the rest of my life where I'm suddenly far more in tune with my intuition and believe in it than before I started this whole process. So it becomes much more seamless. You don't necessarily have to go into a trance dance all the time in order to make the transition? Exactly. Yes. So it's a form of training, isn't it? It is. Yes, it is. It truly is. And what a fun form. Well, it's just been wonderful having you on the program and learning about the gin and trance dancing. And your book is very, very well researched. I want to tell you that. So it's a lovely book. And thank you for bringing it to the world. Well, thank you. I enjoy talking about it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it shows. And thanks for being on. Our guest this hour has been Yasmin Hinkish. She's the author of Trance Dancing with the Gin. And trust me, if you're going to trance dance, you better do it with the gin. Her website is serpentine.org. That's serpentine.org. This has been The Science of Magic. Remember, you can always listen to past thought-provoking episodes on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. Don't forget to join us on the next episode of The Science of Magic. Until next time, dear ones, may you be blessed with knowledge and comforted with love as you engage in the dance of life. (laughs) 